So I'd like to introduce to you Karen Como from the IWK in Halifax. Um, Karen is a mental health nurse, and the majority of her clinical experience has been working with youth, families, and staff in the area of child and adolescent mental health. Karen uh, received her master's degree in nursing from Dalhousie University, and um, that was just recently in May 2010. The focus of her graduate studies included understanding aggression and exploring best practices best practice approaches for addressing aggression and promoting safety for all. So uh, perhaps at this moment, I will uh, turn the um, speaker over to Karen Como and uh, perhaps with a bit of help from Darlene to get her going. And uh, we look forward to your presentation, Karen. I know it's something we've wanted to receive at the Patient Safety Collaborative for some time. Thank you, Tracy. I am thrilled to be here to present some of my graduate studies work and participate in a discussion about enhancing patient safety in situations of child aggression. Aggression is one of the most challenging phenomena in child psychiatry. My initial interest in child aggression arose from two questions. How do we understand child aggression as a society and within the healthcare community? as well as how do we address it. This initial interest was fueled by the fact that mental health care communities were concerned about the use of seclusion and restraint. Along my journey, I found a document entitled The Safety Competencies that is developed by Canadian Patient Safety Institute. What I liked about this document is that the safety competencies supports a process for sustainable change. They describe how to work together to ensure safer outcomes and also include the importance of incorporating the change into a team member's belief and value system. Although each slide within this presentation may not speak directly to the safety competencies, I am hoping you will find that the underpinnings are evident as this presentation unfolds. When I conducted a historical literature review over the last 200 years, I discovered that where aggression was managed changed over time. However, societal thinking about aggression has changed little. For instance, in the 1800s, people were removed from society and neglected or punished in jails. In the 1850s, they were treated in asylums with kindness and compassion. In the 1900s, Jails and almshouses were institutions of choice. In 1950s, treatment with medication in the community. For, child, for the management of child aggression, in the 1800s, children were sold rather than jailed. In the 1850s, they were treated in asylums like adults. In the 1920s, the creation of child guidance clinics in the U.S. started. In the 1970s, um, children were treated in community and hospital mental health services. Evidence suggests that a lack of understanding of aggression creates fear and anxiety in people, which leads to reactive approaches and decreased communication. As a result, patient safety is compromised. Treatment, treatment approaches can be clustered into two main categories, reward consequence approaches and collaborative approaches. Reward consequence approaches involve rewarding staff determined desired behavior and penalizing undesired behaviors. Collaborative approaches involve helping children to identify thoughts and feelings and problem solve to find a mutually agreeable solution. Although there are strengths and limitations to both approaches, providing consequences in re response to minor infractions can lead to power struggles between adults and children within a mental health setting. In some situations, providing consequences result in children emotionally decompensating to a point where restraint and or seclusion are utilized. When a child emotionally decompensates, their behavior becomes a safety concern to themselves and others. In addition, intervening with restraint or seclusion increases the risk of harm to patients and to staff. 
Therefore, an approach that is rigidly applied within the context has the potential to negatively influence safe outcomes for all. In addition, when staff are uncertain as to how to manage situations to support the child to fundamentally change his or her thinking and problem solving, they fall back on past practices which can increase the potential for patient harm. Collaborative approaches include the components of working together, skill building, and proactive planning. Working together includes partnering with, communication and collaboration to better understand what triggers aggression and how to enhance patient safety. Additional aspects of working together include demonstrating respect, utilizing positive approaches, engaging with the patient and family, and having discussions to promote safe care. Skill building is a component that pertains to both patients and staff. It involves strengthening an ability to problem solve situations or building emotional competence. Skill building among staff requires staff balance the tension between providing an opportunity to help children sort through their difficulties and the need to ensure a safe environment for all. When staff are able to balance the tension, there is a reduction in harm to patients. Proactive planning is a reflective process where team members use information gathered through reflection to develop a plan for anticipating and mitigating known risk. Staff proactively partner with patients and families to predict aggression, work together to address factors that trigger aggression, and optimize patient safety. Despite the evidence that show, shows the benefits of working together, skill building, and proactive planning, little has changed over the years in the way that child aggression is viewed and addressed. There is a common understanding that moving evidence to action is a challenge. However, what we do know about organizational change is that staff adopt a change in practice when the new policy fits with the organization's vision, directions, and activities. Policies in keeping with collaborative approaches promote a culture shift to collaboration which benefits patient safety. In addition, policies in keeping with collaborative approaches create the context within which change in practice can occur, which fits well with a blame-free and just culture. As a result of the influence that policies have on supporting staff to embrace collaborative approaches for addressing aggression, I reviewed selected policy-related documents to determine how in keeping policies were with collaborative approaches. I selected documents from all three levels, an international national level, provin provincial level, and an example institution. A range of documents were selected from guiding principles to legislation, standards, policies, influential reports, and tools. All documents spoke to the role of patient, family, staff, and environment in promoting a safe environment. These documents were critiqued for the degree of consistency with collaborative approaches. For example, were they minimally consistent? frequently consistent, or were collaborative approaches embedded within the document. What I discovered was that the majority of international national policies, regardless of the type of policy document reviewed, were very in keeping with collaborative approaches for addressing aggression. Collaborative approaches are particularly linked to optimizing patient safety. International national documents support a complex understanding of aggression and a complex, uh, comprehensive plan for addressing aggression which decreases patient harm and increases patient safety. In addition, the majority of these documents recognize the need to develop staffed capacity to intervene and promote safety. International national policies provide direction on how to deliver safe care, including how to partner with patients and families as equal members of the team. 
The national policy that I was particularly impressed with was the safety competencies document. The safety competencies are divided into six domains. Collaborative approaches are reflected in all domains. The focus of collaborative approaches is to work proactively to prevent episodes of aggression and therefore contribute to a culture of patient safety. Understanding aggression requires a deep team approach where all team members, including patients and families, work together to better understand aggression and what triggers it to decrease harm and increase patient safety. How to build rapport as well as how to communicate with patients to enhance patient safety is the foundation of collaborative approaches. The use of empathy, non-judgmental approaches, use of reassurance, seeking clarity to understand triggers for aggression, communicating early to prevent escalation of behaviors are some of the strategies used. Collaborative approaches encourage teams to identify priorities based on risk of harm to patients. In addition, collaborative approaches begin with discovering environmental factors that trigger aggression and decrease patient safety. Human factors that influence patient safety, such as falling back on past practices in situations that threaten personal safety and the safety of others, are recognized and suggestions provided for building capacity. Although the final domain is not where we want to spend most of our time, when adverse events happen, we want to address the event in a collaborative manner. Whereas most learning objectives are knowledge and skill based, the safety competencies understand the complexity of demonstrating patient safety as each domain is divided into three elements, knowledge, skills, and attitude. The safety competencies describe how to work together to ensure safer outcomes. They also promote building knowledge and skills to facilitate a change in attitude which enhances patient safety. In conclusion, how we understand aggression has not changed significantly. Collaborative approaches enhance patient safety, improves patient outcomes, and promotes safety, staff well-being. International national policies support collaborative approaches for addressing aggression. Implementing collaborative approaches to addressing aggression is hard work and requires ongoing support and mentorship. The safety competencies is a foundational tool that supports the implementation of collaborative approaches for addressing aggression. I'd now like to um, share three questions that I have to stimulate some discussion amongst the group. Why has there been little change in regards to how child aggression is viewed and addressed? If we know collaborative approaches enhance patient safety, what prevents us from implementing collaborative approaches to addressing aggression? And finally, how can the safety competencies be used to support this attitudinal change discussed today? Karen, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. And it's really exciting, I think, to see the link to the safety which we actually spent so much time on over the course of the last year introducing and um, raising awareness of. So the, here's a, an absolute um, direct application of those competencies to a, speci a specific uh, area of care of ch for children and youth. So thanks for highlighting that. I'd like to take a moment now and open up the floor. Um, Lisa, I don't know if you've received any questions written, but I wondered if in general to everybody if there are any questions that you would have of Karen um, to, and particularly to answer any of the questions that she has thrown up at the end. Hopefully you can see them, but certainly she did ask about um, why has there been little change in how childhood aggression is viewed and addressed. Um, if we know collaborative approaches enhance safety, uh, what prevents us from using them to address childhood aggression? And then of course, how can the safety competencies be used to support change? as it's discussed today. So opening up the floor. Okay. 
Hello. Can you hear us? Absolutely. Okay. We are from the Montreal Children's Hospital. We, uh, my name is Lila Amirali. I'm the child psychiatrist. Uh, oh. And my name is Michelle Paquette. I'm the manager of the of our unit here in child psychiatry. And we have with us uh, Madame Nathalie Trastou, risk manager at Pfizer. Hi. Welcome. We just wanted to tell you that uh, thank you so much, first of all, for presenting this uh, interesting document and your findings from your uh, study. Uh, we just wanted to share with you <coughs> because it has been now a couple of years since we have uh, really introduced this collaborative approach. And um, as a risk manager here can tell you, we have an extremely positive experience with uh, um, like our code whites that have almost disappeared completely uh, with, uh, I think, much better patient and family satisfaction and as well as sa staff satisfaction. And uh, as for your first question, I think that uh, actually second question, what prevents us? I think what makes it difficult is that there is always a, a hesitation to change the way that we practice. There is some inertia if you want. But once uh, I believe, uh, you know, the ones that will introduce the change, uh, people who are more um, responsible for, in a way, the vision of the collaborative approach are able to transmit that. We, I admit that we didn't have uh, much resistance from our staff at all. In fact, it was um, all embraced and uh, everybody is a lot happier. Mm -hmm. We've also put in place a lot of tools in order to be able to uh, work collaboratively with our patients and their families so staff are aware of those tools like we have a risk assessment that's done on admission for every child, adolescent who comes into our unit, where we sit down with the adolescent and their families and look at the triggers and look at what, what they feel triggers and how they feel about aggression and what makes them angry and so on, and that's shared within the team. So the team finds this tool very important and they share together and they see the results. We have had quite a decrease of the need to use restraints. Uh, the need to contain patients, it's been quite dramatic. In, and so the, the staff has also witnessed that doing this brings very good results. They feel better about what they're doing, and the, the children respond better to the way they're, they're being treated as well. So I think that's very positive. That's excellent. Thank you so much for sharing um, your outcomes with using a collaborative approach. I, I agree with you. Um, around those types of positive outcomes that, that staff experience and the challenges with um, getting people to embrace a change or a different way of doing things. I think it, it's particularly tough when the change that we're introducing um, is around aggression because aggression um, has the potential to influence a person's personal safety. Um, but I agree with you, if, if you're able to uh, put things in place and have tools to support children and family and staff end up experience, having positive experience and feeling more fulfilled by their uh, the way that they interact with kids and families and that there's more positive outcomes and there's a decrease in, in the use of restraint and seclusion, that uh, those outcomes sort of fuel and support the change. Thank you. I have a question here. This is Lisa. I have a question uh, from Brenda, and it's, uh, does the IWK have a policy for the management of the aggressive child? We have a uh, policy around least restraint for the organization. We're working on a policy around uh, least restraint for our mental health and addictions team. Um, and that particular program specific around using least restraint with uh, children and youth. That particular policy is really in keeping with um, a lot of this information around collaborative approaches. Um, and uh, we're still in the process of finalizing that particular policy because within, our, within uh, the IWK, there's 23 teams that are part of mental health and addiction. And to be honest, not all of our teams have, have bought into a collaborative way of working with children and youth. Um, so 
it's we're getting there, but it's a, it's a challenge, and I think that this particular policy will help to support people in how they move forward with uh, partnering with kids and, and families to reduce um, aggression. And I'm just going to add to Karen's one of the um, the Starlene one of the issues that that brings up when you have a number of teams that are some are in house based some are what we would have termed in the past as residential we now call 24/7 and some are community teams and if all teams so as patients flow through the system if all teams haven't bought into the same approach it can be very confusing for the patients, for the family, and for the staff members um, as a consistent approach across the continuum of care. I have a, a comment here from uh, Jennifer. I don't know if she just wants to speak up, but I'll certainly read what you wrote here. So in answer to question one, I think as we know it's a bit of a taboo area and staff uh, are un, uh, do underreport the incidences and sometimes seeing uh, seeing it as part of the job. So for us, and I'm assuming at Jennifer's organization, a re-education of staff is important, as well as we are doing a crisis management training now across uh, the PEDS, NICU, ER, and adolescent mental health. This is an interprofessional and collaborative approach, and is hoped this will improve the consistency of practice. That's great. Thank you for, uh, for sharing that. Uh, Jennifer, um, you're right. I think sometimes when people think that it's part of the job, then aggression becomes okay. Um, and I that's think it's what, important. That's what I see. For me, I, is that what is that what you see? Particularly on the peds unit, I think I've seen. It's only um, you know meeting with that uh, the nurse or the physician, whoever it was that um, something transpired with, and and um, speaking with them on a number of occasions, it's, it's become recognized that, you know, that it really wasn't okay <laughs> for, for um, that situation to have occurred and that person to have been kicked or punched or, you know, mm -hmm. and that we actually need to do more with that situation than just say, oh, well, you know, they were upset with me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, absolutely. What, what, and, and looking at what the triggers were to that particular aggressive episode and what, how, how can we partner with them, understand it better, and develop a plan from per, uh, preventing it from happening again. Our adolescent mental health unit is much better at that, um, but we don't share staff across the PEDS and adolescent mental health areas. So um, that's why we're, gonna, we're doing um, more education that will involve all of those teams because they see different things. And so I think my P staff will become a lot more aware, self-aware, and aware of different uh, things they can do to um, to be safe, and also to help that child be safe. Mm -hmm. That's great. I think it's wonderful that um, teams uh, that have uh, more expertise and collaboration around aggression are providing support to teams uh, that this may new be new or not as frequently encountered. I think that's really uh, wonderful around team collaboration and how do we help build capacity within our teams regardless of where we work. Karen, it, it's Elaine. And I, I too wanna wanna say thank you so much for just, just a fantastic presentation and thank you to everybody as as well from Montreal and Toronto and so forth that are providing some really neat uh, and important feedback. I'm just wondering as um as a group of us all together and that's everyone on on, on the line and, and the organizations we represent, we have an opportunity, I'm hearing I what I one of the things I appreciated among many, Karen, was your um, correlation with with uh, your study to the um, the competencies, the Canadian uh, PDI, uh, the Canadian Patient Safety Institute six competencies and, or or six domains, I should say. And I'm just wondering, from from a, a, a national perspective, or from a let's let's zero down on from CAFC's Patient Safety Collaborative, how could we um, initiate a, I don't want to call it um, 
an intervention because that's not what I mean, but more of a education and uh, knowledge translation um, process where we can begin to show that relationship and and I think have people think about the whole challenge of aggression begin to think about it differently because you know as you relate to it um, in, in in terms of working in teams or the risk uh, you know the risks uh, domain that you refer to I think that may be helpful in just helping us frame this differently and I don't know if I'm articulating this well enough I don't feel I am but I just feel that there's an opportunity here for us as a collective to take your study findings to take the experiences at Montreal Children's for example almost uh, apply it to the competencies or to these domains we're talking about and maybe educate and and use knowledge translation um, strategies or, or tactics as a way to bring new knowledge, new ways to think about this. Is that making any sense to you, Karen? I think that's a great idea. I, I uh, in my experience in supporting one of the teams that, uh, at the IWK who moved forward with implementing uh, more collaborative approaches, a lot of the education and support that I provided was around scenario-based examples. Mm -hmm. So people were able to understand the basic components of collaboration, what working together meant, what were the cluster of behaviors around proactive planning. But then when they had to actually, when the rubber hit the road and they actually had to use it, that's where they ran into some real challenges. And therefore, what our learning turned into, our learning opportunities turned into, were situations where we took live cases of kids uh, that were currently within the program and um, used it as examples of how we may um, work together in a collaborative way with this child and family. So I think, I think you're right. That knowledge translation piece is huge, mm -hmm. and being able to um, bring it to life is so important for people to understand of, and feel comfortable in working with it. And, and, and encourage people ultimately to think about this differently or help people think about it differently. Absolutely. Yeah. It gives us really good food for thought. Well, I think that this is actually something that we could perhaps, I no wait, before I even jump in, does anybody else even have any other comments that they'd like to share with Karen and um, and the rest of us? Or would you like to comment on, on Elaine's most recent uh, uh, addition to our discussion? Uh, this is Carol Cook from TIO. I think we're at the end. But yeah. I, again, just want to compliment the work that was done in terms of linking um, your, your, um, your report to the competencies. I think, you know, we all have challenges in implementing any changes. We mm -hmm. all have our challenges in, in working towards enhancing our culture of patient safety in our institutions. And I think it's it made me start thinking about the fact that of our changes that we want to implement and we try and link them to the competencies, it just might help our colleagues to understand the whole and work towards implementing the changes a bit faster and, and more appropriately. Mm -hmm. and, and I know people are signing off, so just one very quick comment to Carol's, Tracy, would be that I also think that the uh, competencies might bring a little bit of credibility or legitimacy to help the situations that, um, Karen, you refer to where not everybody's on board, not everybody is seeing it the same way. And, and if you sort of bring the competencies as a framework, um, that, that maybe brings a little bit of, uh, a little bit more black and white to a subject that, that may be a little gray and harder to, to grab onto. I, th I think that's a, a wonderful idea, um, absolutely. I know um, in working with some teams around uh, implementing collaborative approaches, they found that it was really helpful when they saw 
that uh, there were documents out there that are put forward by reputable, well-respected organizations, leaders in the field, and that the collaborative approaches um, were embedded or reflected in those documents. It really supported them to embrace a change. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Um, this is Gerarda Cronin. I just have a, a suggestion. Um, I was part of the team that developed the safety competencies, um, and as you know, um, the Pediatric Chairs of Canada have, um, in fact, a, a lovely website where the safety competencies have been sort of further developed into curricula. Mm -hmm. um, so there is endorsement of the safety competencies by, you know, your local friendly medical director, including Jonathan Cronick. Um, and um, it seems to me that it certainly would be possible to develop um, some additional educational materials, which could include, for example, videotapes of role play mm -hmm. um, around the competencies in the context of childhood. Yeah. And um, so there is actually a place for these things to reside. Um, which you know has the endorsement of of people who work with you, um, and um, you know I think that your material could definitely be part of what's posted on that website, um, but obviously it needs to be more. There needs to be more of an ownership um, among teams. I, I think that's a great idea. Um, that I think that really helps to bring it to life too for folks when they're able to actually see um, how collaborative approaches would be connected to the safe, safety competencies in real life situations. That visual learning, um, because so many of us are visual learners, would be so um, helpful. I think it's great. Well, well certainly, certainly in teaching the patient safety competencies, um, I find the case studies useful, and, and sometimes we use our own case studies, but um, bringing it to, to reality is important. And, and uh, in the case of aggression, I mean, you could design a little case study that was written, but you could also, um, you know, use do some simulation, and you could videotape that in order to share it. And it need not necessarily be up on the patient safety competencies website, but you can you can use that framework that's already there. Uh, this is Lisa. I'd just like to make a comment just so that everybody um, is aware. Uh, the safety competencies curriculum, the patient safety curriculum uh, that was developed uh, with the PCC, the Pediatric Chairs of Canada, is on the CAFC website on our Knowledge Exchange Network. So if you go to the CAFC website, you'll see across the, the, the bar at the, uh, at the top, it says Ken which means Knowledge Exchange Network, and you can go in there under the safety competencies. But I can send everybody a link to that after this call today so that you can see it yourself. And, um, and you can also go to the Pediatric Chairs of Canada website, from mm -hmm. which there is also a link on the CAFC website as one of the partner organizations. Right, right. And, and I think as a last comment, I think as a that almost as a um, as a CAFC patient safety collaborative, we can we can build on that model that that you'll you'll visit on the on the PCC website as well as the Knowledge Exchange Network, and and really maybe take some of our conversations this morning a few steps further. I think there's some really exciting opportunity that. Uh, Karen, that your presentation and the wonderful discussion that's followed uh, has really stimulated. And perhaps on that note, thank you, Elaine. It's Tracy, just because there may be a flurry of more beeps. Um, I want to take a moment and thank Karen very much for your presentation. And, uh, and certainly, as Darlene had mentioned, I believe the slides will be made available. Um, my apologies to everyone for the little technical hiccups we had at the beginning, um, but we hope you'll join us again either at the Patient Safety Collaborative um, meeting in CAFC in, uh, at CAFC in Winnipeg in October or uh, certainly at our next meeting on November 26th. So thank you, everyone, and I hope you have a great Friday. <laughs>